Boys and girls, do I have a fun one for you today. I've been waiting for this rifle to come out for some time. This is the Henry Long Ranger 223. This just might be the world's best suppressor host yet in 223 Remington, which is a caliber that is often thought of as challenging to suppress or does not suppress well. We did a video on the original Long Ranger some years ago, and this one comes to market with some very interesting features that I'm looking forward to showing you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into it because we've got some ground to cover. The Long Ranger Express is a firearm designed to meld the precision of a bolt gun with the speed of a lever action. To accomplish this, the rifle is built around a six lug rotating bolt mounted on a camming carrier. This interfaces with a 16.5 inch 1 in 9 free floated barrel. If that wasn't cool enough for you, one of the more interesting features I found is the hammer drop safety, which is comprised of a sliding metal slat that contacts the pin when the trigger is pulled, but moves out of the way when being let down manually. To aid in this action, Henry has also included an optional reach bar, allowing you to use low rings on big scopes on that chunky 1913 rail. The rifle is finished out with a beautiful birch stock and a rubber butt pad to take some of the perceived weight out of the hand. All right, guys and gals, it is quite literally the calm before the storm. We're about to get a frog croaker. So I wanted to come out and shoot the initial accuracy on this gun and obviously zero it, which I just completed. And I wanted to do it unsuppressed first because then tomorrow I plan to come back after this gun has been suppressed and see how the gun reacts to being suppressed. So we're gonna put a 5.56 can on this and then come back tomorrow. And about that time, we'll probably talk about the threading as well on the end of this thing. All right, guys and gals. Well, it is the calm before the storm, quite literally. We are about to get a serious frog croaker. So I wanted to run out here really quick, zero the rifle, and then also do an initial accuracy test because tomorrow I intend to come back with this gun suppressed. And we're going to shoot the same target. So I'm going to go down there and rip that high contrast target off the cardboard and we're going to bring the same one back tomorrow and shoot group for group. So this is going to be the initial accuracy test. We're shooting uh, Fioki 223A. This is a 55 grain FMJ boat tail. And what else do we need? I forgot it if it is. It's not, couldn't be possibly to be that important. And there you have it, there's our initial group. I'll have it measured on screen for you. I'm excited to see what happens after we add the suppressor to this because usually after we can the thing up, our groups shrink a little bit. Now here's the thing, I can't help you out on one of these things because it's made out of solid unobtainium. And even if I wanted to, I can't even allude to doing such a thing because it's against the YouTube terms of service. But what I can do is help you guys out on a regular basis with some of the brands that we work with uh, and have been working with for some time. And all that information is contained over at the Linktree 
account, which you can find a link to in the description box down below. And at the top of the page, you will find all of our hot deals that we have going on right now. Things like PowerTac lights, and then there's also a link over to the full affiliates page, so all the stuff that we've banked up over the years that you guys can take advantage of as VSO viewers. Thank you. And wouldn't you know it, out here on day two, and it is going to rain again. <laughs> like, I might get wet during this actual sequence. Uh, before we get going, though, I want to talk about the threading on the gun, like I mentioned. And the reason I'm doing this now is because I actually have a second video that I'm working on that is my one hour lecture on cans. And I needed to do a section on the threading of the barrel and how to uh, identify a properly threaded barrel for mating with a suppressor. And this just so happens to be a case study on how to properly thread a barrel. So the number one thing that you're looking for is that the diameter of the barrel is greater than the diameter of the thread. What that's gonna do is generate a shoulder behind the thread. And what that does is it allows the suppressor components to sync up to a CNC'd what we're gonna call, at least reasonably assumed, perfectly flat shelf at the back of the thread. So that precision machine CNC'd mount is going to sync up against that perfectly machine CNC'd shoulder that is cut concentric to the bore, as in the center of the bore is the center at which that thread axis is done. Those are important factors. Those are the most important factors. After that, we wanna make sure that there is a bit of a gutter behind that thread. And the purpose of that is one, to make sure during the manufacturing process that the chips from the threading can have a place to go. But when what we're concerned about is that that thread is allowed to free float a little bit behind the threads before it sinks up to that shoulder. And what that allows us to do is make sure that it comes into contact uniformly. It isn't being drug in any particular direction before it comes in contact with the shoulder. And this is a prime example of proper threading. Good job, Henry. Oop. Rifle shifted on that one. So there's gonna be one that is gonna be low left. keeping that in it scared the shit out of me yesterday's group unsuppressed today's group suppressed and then the one that i mentioned that uh was a user error r5 much tighter than r5 from yesterday's so we got a little bit tighter it does look like i need to clean up a little bit of point of impact shift though so a few hours and a rainstorm later and we're back here at the 400 yard mark and uh, we're gonna see if we can hit anything with this rifle since i left you guys i've since tinkered with this rifle a little bit, I've changed the suppressor because just because you're shooting 5.56 doesn't mean that you should use a 5.56 suppressor. So I switched this one out to a 30 caliber suppressor just because I think it's gonna be a little bit more compatible. The groups that I, were, that I was getting after switching to the 30 caliber suppressor were better. But as you guys can see, or I hope that you guys can see, because I can barely hear it, I don't know if the microphone's picking it up or not, it's a chip shot. The safety on this gun is currently engaged. If I want to take the safety off, I pull the hammer to the set position. To put the safety back on, I have to apply downward pressure to the hammer, pull the trigger to disengage the sear, and then ride the hammer forward. Obviously, Anybody with two neurons that fire in the same direction, you can figure out that there's a potential for danger here. If you slip, that's why this thing is very aggressively knurled here on this reach bar. If you slip, it might have enough inertia to impart to the firing pin, to set their cartridge off. If you don't mean to send a round, it's not good to send around. So my question is, does this actually work? So what I've got here is just some prime brass. There's no projectile, no powder. And first off, what we're gonna do 
is I'm just gonna drop this round into the chamber and I wanna see if this thing has a floating firing pin. It will leave an artifact on the primer of the round. Indeed it does, and I'll have a macro shot for you guys to see that yes, there is an artifact there in the center of the primer where the firing pin kind of rode forward and just touches the brass. People used to freak out about this sort of stuff. Disengage the series, see it's floating in my, in my hand there, and we're just gonna let go. Yeah, I'm going with no change. We'll have a, again, a shot for you guys. Now let's see what happens. Much different. In this segment, we're going to be talking about stability, specifically what grain weight range the Henry Long Ranger is capable of stabilizing. Now, whenever I do a test like this, it seems to me like the discussion and the comments always devolves to like a relative group size comparison between the grain weights, and that is not the point. <laughs> so to that end, today I'm going to purposefully shoot really trashy groups. I'm going to try to print like five inch groups out there just to ensure that that doesn't happen. What we're actually looking for is the shape of the holes. And from the shape of the holes, we can draw some inferences on whether it is or is not stabilizing that ammunition. So the different types of ammos that we're gonna be using today are this stuff. This is our standard mainstay Fiocchi 223A. This is from the Range Dynamics line, and it's a 55 grain projectile. We're also gonna be doing this stuff, which is a 77 grain Match King. And then, the reason really why I'm really hesitant to shoot tight groups or attempt to shoot tight groups is we're going to be using some 855 today. And I don't think there's anybody out there that believes this to be super consistent ammunition. And if we used group size to compare, it would lead us to believe that it's incapable likely of of stabilizing 62 grain ammunition just based on the variability in the ball ammo. Down here at the other end, and what I'm seeing is pretty round. The only one that looks maybe a little bit suspect is the 77. I see some indication that there may be some instability here, but the 62 and the 55 look fine. I'll have some macros up here for you guys to look at and draw your own conclusions. None of these are egregious. We don't see any like bullet flying sideways type stuff, which I have seen out of rifles that are brand new before. So I would say that this is doing all right. Well, that's all the time we have today for the Henry Long Ranger Express in 223. It's a fun gun, definitely a fun gun. If there was one critique I would add to this video, it's that I would like to see this gun offered in a one and eight twist. And the reason I think that is is because we just finished doing some testing a few weeks ago and one and eight performed the best out of all the twist rates that we had access to. But I can see an argument for the one and nine barrel because I think that this gun is kind of geared towards, at least conceptually in my mind, I would think that it would be like a long range small game gun like prairie dogs, groundhogs, gophers, things like that. And a lot of those guys are using lightweight rounds. We're talking 40, 45 grain, like uh, so copper solids, things like that, that are spanking out there really fast. And those are gonna perform great in a one and nine twist gun. Where I think that we would have problems is on the inverse of that. I know that there's some very heavy 5.56 five, loads out of there, or, or I mean, uh, 223 loads out there. And we're talking like 90, 95 grain. And I would venture to guess that even though it was stable at 77 grain, it's probably gonna start having problems up in that upper range. And some guys may want to shoot those to buck the wind more out to long range. Again, I think it's a relatively insignificant detail, but if they were doing another skew, like Henry needs more skews, right? Then, hey, maybe a one and eight, test it, see what happens. But we don't have it here today, so not going to. But yes, Henry Long Ranger Express, I had a great time with it. And if you can get your hands on this solid piece of unobtainium, then I think that you'll have a great time too.